All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Spencer. Uh, my name is uh, Sastri Vedam. I'm in uh, the Department of Radiation Physics Medicine Cancer Center in Houston. <clears throat> Today I'm going to be talking about quality reassurance of linear accelerators. I don't need this to make, although I'm required to do this. I do want to acknowledge uh, Paula Berner here for uh, putting me in touch with uh, Spencer and also the AMD for uh, inviting me to talk on this topic. Uh, the one that I don't want to make, or I do want to make in this talk is that any material presented in this webinar, web, webinar is meant only for educational purposes and it does not constitute endorsement of specific products shown. So with that, uh, let's review some of the objectives for this webinar. And these are really yeah, to understand the necessity of an effective quality assurance program for linear accelerators. And also to understand that the quality assurance can have both like form specific and function specific aspects to it, as we will discuss. And also gain greater appreciation of the role of an effective quality assurance program in enhancing dosimetric ability to plan for and for a safe and accurate delivery of therapeutic radiation. So attention to um, an article that the New York Times uh, posted. This was about uh, January 2010. Um, again, unnecessary spotlight uh, on our field in general. But nevertheless, uh, it pointed out a lot of errors that were being seen um, in the, the radiation therapy field. Um, these include things such as a computer, director, a computer error that directed a linear accelerator uh, blast a hedonic uh, treatment region with errant beams. Um, in another case, for a breast cancer patient who absorbed uh, extra, in this case, what, three times the prescribed amount for the first 27 fractions. Um, and then there are instances uh, where a hospital gave a wrong radiation dose to more than 90 patients with prostate cancer and then kept quiet about it. And also, Another hospital that disclosed 77 brain cancer patients that had received 50% 50, 50 more radiation dose than prescribed because the linear accelerator was programmed incorrectly for almost a year. And that brings us to the topic of this webinar, quality assurance and why it is important. Um, it it worked to realize that more than half of all cancer patients do receive some form of radiation therapy be it external beam, uh, brachy, whatever it is. Um, approximately one in 20 of these patients will experience injury, mostly due patients from safe radiation delivery, but some of the above may actually be due to mistakes made during radiation therapy, and we need to address these. So an effective radio assurance or a QA program is therefore essential in ensuring such you know, safe and accurate delivery. And as I mentioned before, the QA can be both form specific, um, you know, so just like a mechanical, dosimetry uh, aspects, or it could be function specific. Um, with modern accelerator, we talk about image guided radiation therapy, intensity modulated therapy, stereotactic radiation, and respiratory motion management. Each of these functions has some specific QA aspects to it. So let's start by discussing some of the mechanical um, QA. So let's remember that the machine linear accelerator is actually a combination of mechanical components and electrical and electronic components. And so all of these have to be QA'd on a periodic basis. Um, we use a variety of QA tools, starting with something as simple as a graph paper as shown here. And this is very useful to do basic things like verifying the light field, um, collimator rotation, the position of the jaws for different field sizes, both in the symmetric mode and the AC mode, for example. And then we have jigs uh, that we create. We call them phantoms. That helps the uh, coincidence, of the coincidence of the light field versus radiation field. Um, and also verification of the radiation isocenter using these star shots or spoke shots. This is an example of a radiation isocenter verification for different positions of the couch as um, you know, the couch gets moved on different angles. We can do this 
uh, with the collimator also. I just turn the collimator around, use a very narrow field, put a really long field at the same time, uh, make a pin prick on that film. Now again, uh, what is shown here is results from film exposure. So we make a, a pin prick at the center here uh, where everything the crosshairs are and then just shoot these uh, um, exposed at different uh, collimator angles. This is for uh, a similar type of test, uh, just testing the gantry rotation. Again, these are um, mostly qualitative, but you can make them quantitative tests also. Um, light versus radiation field coincidence, um, shown here is the film result for a 6 mv beam. And all those dark spots that you see around the edges of each field size are the pinpricks based on a light field. So you can basically see that there's good coincidence light and the radiation field. Sure, is a similar test for an 18 mv beam, and again, the results look pretty good. But, uh, for my comfort, there's way too many dots here or pinpricks. Nevertheless, uh, these are some of the mechanical tests that we do. Um, again, I do want to make this clear that um, given the time frame for this talk, uh, this is not going to be a very comprehensive uh, presentation aspects of the QA, just highlights of some of the tests that we do. So quickly moving on to the dosimetry aspects. Um, before too much further, Let's have a brief risk, uh, refresher on excitations of matter. So as we all know, um, typically how we deliver radiation is by accelerating a beam of electrons that hit a target, and the Brunström radiation that happens as a result of the electrons hitting the target um, is takes these photons that are incident on the matter or on, uh, on the medium. And once they hit this medium, they interact with the electrons in the medium and give out the electrons and the scattered photons. So contrapolar belief or perception, it is not the photons that deliver the dose, but it is the secondary electrons that are actually generated by the incident photons that deliver the dose. And that happens through various means of interaction, ionization, and energy deposition mechanism. Now, as they happen, there is also some loss. Radiation, characteristic X-rays, Bremsterlung, and some positron annihilation as well. Um, and then this deposition usually happens in the form of ions. And these ions can therefore, if we put a chamber in there with an electrometer, um, can be measured. We also have to remember that not all ions can be captured by this ion chamber. There is some loss that happens due to recombination also. So sometimes uh, we do include a fudge factor in our readings to account for this recombination. The typical characteristics of an ion chamber. Um, the ion chamber is, again, uh, the primary uh, device that we use um, to uh, do the dosimetry calibration or the absolute dose calibration. So a lot of you might have seen this graph here um, you know, uh, in one of your courses, which is just a plotting voltage that's applied across the ion chamber versus the charge that is collected for various um, regions on this voltage scale where we study is what's called the ion chamber region or the ionization region, where uh, these are being large changes in voltage supplied to the ion chamber. The output of the charge that's collected is fairly constant, provided the energy of the radiation that's applied is constant. So, and the reason why this is important is because uh, the output in this case is not so sensitive to changes in voltage that's applied across the ion chamber. Uh, this is what is usually used in, like, in the megavoltage region. Uh, now, once you go uh, for these uh, uh, server, for example, the Geiger counters and all of these, they actually use a proportionality type of uh, uh, chamber which from our ion chambers. So, uh, recapping that, the, the most important factors that ion chambers uh, 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 are characterized are the geometry, the, sh the material in the wall and the electrode and its thickness, and the air volume in the chamber. And depending on these three characteristics, we have different types of chambers that are being used. Um, let's see these uh, 
free air chambers. These are usually kind of these big boxes that you see uh, where a small collimated beam traverses through a large air volume that's inside of there. Um, and then this air volume is then subjected to, the, to this electric field which then collects whatever ions that are formed here because of the interaction of these X-rays with the air that's present in this, in this uh, volume. Uh, the problems with these types of chambers are first of all that if you look at this it's kind of bulky and to move it in and around uh, in a treatment room is actually fairly cumbersome. There are also these maintaining the constancy of an electric field over such a big air volume as you can see. And so these are typically used in standards laboratories like the National Institute of Standards where that's pretty much uh, their main job is to ensure that uh, you know, we have a proper standard. So you don't often see them in use in any of the clinics. But mostly these are used to set standards. These chambers called the thimble chambers because of the shape um, that's in the form of thimble. Um, so basically what they have is an air cavity and then a shell that surrounds that cavity. So this thimble wall or the shell that you see here is actually made of air equivalent material and therefore the volume of air that's required for, this, for these interactions is much much less compared to what you see in a free air, free air chamber. And therefore their size is also very, very uh, small compared to the free air chambers. And that is these type of chambers to be used easily in a clinic environment or, or in a machine environment like we often see. And then these parallel plate chambers. These were all developed for a specific purpose. The difference again is that um, instead of a thimble shape, we have a disc shape or a pancake shape probe which has these electrodes and an air volume that's kind of uh, in between these two electrodes and you have this high voltage, uh, uh, um, high voltage connected here and the x-rays, the electrons, uh, whichever beam that you're measuring typically enter uh, this chamber from the window as shown here. So these are better for uh, when you enter encounter steep depth dose gradients um, such as electron beams and also when one has to make measurements in the buildup region of beams. Regardless of which type of chamber we use, if we have to get any results or any numbers from that, it has to be connected to what's called an electrometer and that's what actually provides this voltage that you see across the chamber. And depending on what we want to use this electrometer for, uh, uh, the, the components that are connected in this feedback loop that you see uh, are going to be different. For example, sometimes there might be a capacitor here uh, and that means the parameter is actually constantly collecting the charge, um, kind of, what do you say, an integrate mode and then when we actually want to measure it, we actually measure the capacitance that it collects. Um, and then we have the rate mode where instead of a capacitor, you actually have a resistor that's connected in the feedback loop here. And so we can then just uh, kind of keep an eye on the dose rate that you see or the current that's generated because of the incidence of radiation. This is useful in some cases. And then if we want to do a direct exposure reading, which is just uh, real-time feedback of um, uh, how much uh, dose or exposure this chamber is receiving, this is typically what you see in like a Geiger counter um, uh, type of scenario. And so those are the electrometers that you would um, want to be used in a direct exposure reading mode. And shown here is just uh, one of the models of electrometers that are widely used in our field. So in terms of which type of ion chamber we use, there are some uh, uncertainties in operation of an ion chamber. Um, these include, uh, you know, just in the physical constants, uh, which include you know, measurement of like temperature, pressure, and things like that. Um, and then the NIST under beam calibration. So this is the uncertainty that um, the standards and laboratory actually determines based on free air iron chamber measurements. And then sometimes there is also a secondary standard where um, you have what are called these accredited dose calibration laboratories that are uh, spread throughout the country um, that trace their calibration back to the NIST. 
And so there are some uncertainties involved there also. In any case, the cumulative uncertainty of the iron chamber as traceable to the nest value is somewhere around 1.6 percent. So when we do our annual, annual QA with any chamber or even commissioning with any chamber, uh, we cannot expect certain twins. Just depending upon how good um, a, a job the physicist does, uncertainty can be lower, but it's not uncommon to see uncertainty that's around like 1.6, sometimes 2 percent. So the AM or the American Association of Physicists and Medicine historically has been developing protocols to establish some guidelines to do this uh, calibration of absolute uh, dose so that uh, across institutions there is some sort of a general formalism that everybody follows um, that ensures that all these machines are calibrated. In 1983 they came out with this protocol called TG21 and as you can see it's a fairly complicated uh, endeavor uh, with uh, lots of sub bullets here, um, lots of sub stages uh, that involve measurement and modeling of several different uh, calibration factors. And this was a very time consuming process. So the AAPM again constituted another task group to the TG51 um, to kind of review these procedures and come up with something simpler. And in 1999 we published this report here, uh, the TG51 report, uh, which lists simpler guidelines, where basically they said, all right, well, let's condense all of that information to this single equation here, where you're basically the dose that you see from a particular quality of a photon beam in the water medium is basically leading, which is M, uh, times some correction factors. And this correction factor here, the calibration factor, is uh, with respect to a cobalt beam. That's always used as a standard at the nest. Um, and so M is basically the reading for a certain amount of dose or a reference dose. And that is obtained um, by the physicist at the time of every annual um, where he measures this reading and applies some correction factors that include for temperature, pressure, electrometer, uh, polarization of the electrometer and the uh, correction. I'm not going to go into too much detail about each of these corrections. These are easily found in the TG51 report. And there is also uh, a talk by uh, uh, Will Hansen, I think freely available on YouTube as well, uh, that uh, one can go and, uh, you know, if uh, uh, you're interested in more detailed information about how to implement TG51. Or, you know, you can always consult uh, the physicist uh, wherever you are at. Um, so whether it is a photon beam or an electron beam, we can then estimate this reference dose for a set of reference conditions. And so for photons, um, the beam quality was then defined as the photon component of the percentage depth dose at 10 centimeter depth for a 10, 10 by 10 field size with uh, the phantom uh, surface uh, being used to the surface if it's an SSD setup and a detector depth if it's an SAT setup. Um, in either case, uh, the SSD was 100, 100 centimeters. For electrons in the hand, they came up with this uh, parameter called R50, which was essentially the depth at absorbed dose where uh, the absorbed dose was 50% uh, of the maximum dose. And this was done with a 10 by 10 cone again at a 100 SSD, although this could be between 90 and 110, depending upon each situation. Uh, and then where these measurements were being made was called the depth in each case. For photons, it was said to be 10 centimeters, and for electrons, it was this 0.6 times R50 minus 0.1. So when you look at this, when you look at the summary, it kind of simplifies the process, makes it easier to understand, and therefore easier to intercompare uh, performance of one machine to the other and even across instances. And that was the whole purpose of uh, the AAPM kind of reviewing this protocol and coming up with this TG51 absolute calibration, which is still being used currently. So as I said before, there is a certain calibration and dosimetry chain uh, that we are all part of when we do this absolute dose calibration. So when the host of the research center or uh, institution, uh, that wherever you work at, uh, the physicist is doing this calibration. 
he or she has access to a iron chamber calibrated to a secondary or a local standard um, and sometimes a strontium source as well especially if you're doing brachytherapy uh, and so there's always that intercomparison that happens between the local standard when we do an annual and then that standard is in turn um, traceable back to the finder which is obtained through either calorimetry or free air, free air chamber at a national standards laboratory such as the NEST and this allows for international intercomparison in several countries as well. So at the end of the day all of the calibrations are pulled back to the NEST. So this leads us to alright so we know that the, uh, there is some uncertainty in um, the ion chamber calibration how does that relate to the total uncertainty of dose delivered to a point in a patient? And this is a table from Khan, uh, Fais Khan, um, where which lists several sources of uh, typical errors that one see during the radiation therapy process. So whereas the ion chamber calibration is roughly around 2%, uh, the caliber procedure itself has an uncertainty of 2%. Those calibration parameters and the methods and the algorithms that we use to calculate those have an uncertainty of 3%. The effective depth by this we mean how uh, we account for inhomogeneities in a patient. Uh, determination of that effective depth also has an uncertainty. The SSD has an uncertainty. Uh, wedges, blocking trigger, beam modifiers have some uh, or introduce some uncertainty into this whole process. Cumulatively we are talking about roughly like a 5% uncertainty or overall uncertainty in dose delivered to a point in the patient. And it's simple addition of all of these factors that give you this 5.6. Actually, uh, it is a combination of a quadrature effect um, that you kind of take into account uh, because all of these um, steps are kind of independent of each other so we can add these results in quadrature instead of a simple addition and that gives us this 5% uh, to absorb dose, uh, the physicist uh, also takes several readings um, to kind of do spot checks on the percentage depth dose for several uh, energies. Um, so uh, typically there's like a 6 and the 18 or the 15 depending upon the type of machine we have for the photons and then there's like a wide variety of electron energies that are associated with each machine. Regardless, for each energy one has to um, come up with these percentage step dose curves for different field sizes and compare that to the reference standard that was established at the time of commissioning, uh, the, uh, commissioning the beam. How <coughs> does percentage step dose at uh, you know 10 by 10 field size and for other field size? We also evaluate what's called flatness and symmetry, um, and this is just an example of how. Um, the beam profile would look a typical um, beam that you would see from a linear accelerator. And the flatness minus the ratio of the Dmax or D minimum across an eighty distance from the full width half maximum. Symmetry can be simply defined as the area here or the area there. Um, or if you want to be a little more complicated, just use this formula. Uh, but as we kind of keep track of how symmetric and how flat this beam is on either side of the central axis. And why is this important? Well, what is shown there is the spatial distribution of X-rays around a thin target. Um, because we are most of the time we encounter beams that are mostly forward directed uh, as far as the spatial distribution goes. But at the same time, uh, they're not flat. And so what happens is uh, we introduce something called a flattening filter in the path of the beam that essentially makes this beam go from some sort of a shape like this to a more flatter shape. And therefore, when we QA our um, profiles, we actually need to ensure that beams are flat uh, when they should be. So this here is an example of a flatness and a symmetry scan. And this is um, a fairly flat and a fairly uh, symmetric beam that you can see here. When the symmetry is off, sometimes this is the type of profiles that we see. And the symmetry can be off because of several reasons. Um, at the end of the day, we all must realize that these are machines uh, that direct electron beams uh, to hit a target. And the way to direct electron beams is to control the magnetic fields using these different uh, magnets 
as the beam uh, that are introduced in the beam pad. And these magnets are also controlled by uh, current of these magnets. And so ensuring the constancy of all these parameters will therefore uh, have an effect on the symmetric uh, or the asymmetric nature of the resultant beam. And this is one way in which we kind of keep an eye on how symmetric that beam is. Uh, in these, uh, we also look at the wedge factor or the wedge transmission factors. Uh, historically, uh, physical wedges have been used, but we don't uh, use physical wedges all the time. It's usually either an enhanced dynamic wedge uh, or a virtual wedge, depending upon which machine uh, you encounter. Um, but regardless, factor is simply just the ratio of those with the wedge in the beam uh, with two uh, the doors without the wedge. And we kind of take this at two different collimator angles just to have an average effect. And this also measure for different field sizes and different depths of clinical interest on a periodic basis. So we talk the various tests um, that um, a physicist usually uh, does, uh, but at what frequency are we required to do these? Uh, there are some tests that we do on a daily basis, some on a monthly basis, some on an annual basis. Um, there is a whole different aspect of QA that's called commissioning a linear accelerator, which I have not discussed because that's a separate topic by itself, um, and uh, it will not fit into the current time frame. And then there is aspect of patient or procedure specific QA that is also not discussed here for exactly the same reasons. So that's pre daily QA. So this is mostly done. Uh, by the uh, therapists in the morning before uh, they start treating patients. And this involves just setting up a simple device like this on the uh, treatment couch and then um, programming the uh, treatment beam to just verify X-ray output constancy, energy constancy, um, and then do some simple mechanical tests that ensure uh, laser localization, the distance indicator, things like that, and also do some basic safety interlock tests. Um, all of these typically take more than like 15 to 20 minutes because if it takes anything any longer than that, then that eats up into the efficiency of the whole process. So these are very simple tests that can very easily be done. And this is an example of a typical daily QA report that uh, would be generated from one of these uh, devices. And the physicist can then go back and kind of review to see how the machine has been doing, let's say, over the past week or the past several weeks or the past several months, um, and see if there's any discrepancies in these outputs or any trend. And then a um, physicist um, is the one that typically does the monthly QA. This is usually done using a different chamber um, that's specifically used for us, and it's done in a solid water phantom. Um, the ideal uh, material for doing all this is water, but um, wheeling a water tank inside and outside of a treatment room every month is going to be very, very cumbersome and inefficient. So uh, this was the solution that was proposed is that we do these monthly tests in this blocks or in the set of blocks uh, which are much easier to transport and kind of set up. And so we perform again some of the similar tests uh, with X-ray output, electron outputs, energies, uh, and some mechanical tests that include light versus radiation field, um, you know, the gantry position, position indicators, crosshair centering, and do some basic safety testing also. And this is in addition to the therapist doing all these tests uh, on a daily basis, and we can kind of intercompare our results for that month with what the therapists have been doing on a daily basis. Uh, let me do this uh, in a little bit. And so this is an example for a spreadsheet um, that the physicist usually develops for uh, kind of keeping track of the monthly outputs and the energies and some of the mechanical tests. And that, then, of course, there is the big test of the models, the annual QA, which takes anywhere between a few hours, um, you know, I won't say a few hours, several hours to maybe two or three days worth of work. Um, it involves uh, having to wheel these sort of contraptions into and out of the uh, treatment room, setting them up, and all of those. So all of these things take some time. Uh, but these are basically more extensive tests of similar parameters, you know, energy, flatness, symmetry, percentage step dose, profiles, output factors, and such, 
Um, and they are, we also test uh, the mechanical uh, robustness of, of the machine at this time. Do the uh, star shot shots that I showed you earlier. And we also do other safety tests as well, the interlocks, um, the emergency off switches in the, in the room, uh, on the machine and outside the room, and also any systems such as respiratory gating or VMAT or any other features that that particular machine may have. And so and all of this is done at the time of the annual. The physicist has at his or her, her hand information about the trends from the daily device, from the monthly setup, and also from the yearly setup. Typically, if the machine were functioning properly and all these systems were functioning properly, these trends would kind of match. Sometimes they don't, and that's when the physicist go in there and figure out exactly what's happening and where things are going wrong or which um, which of these mesh quality and where the machine is going wrong and kind of figure out to get them back to a state uh, like what's shown above. And so um, another example of uh, a spreadsheet that was developed for the TG51 measurement uh, that you can see and each physicist has his or her own version of this TG51 spreadsheet. And that brings us to uh, the last aspect of the form-specific uh, QA, which is safety. And this involves testing door interlocks, audiovisual communication, emergency off switch operations, in-room radiation monitors, and any other interlocks that are special procedure specific, as I mentioned before with respiratory gating, for example. So more on the form-specific QA, let's uh, talk briefly about function-specific QA. So, Modern linear accelerators, as uh, I mentioned, are these really complex machines that do several different things, such as set up, uh, set up verification, uh, treatment delivery, imaging, uh, respiratory gating, IMRT, VMAT, I mean, they have all these technologies kind of integrated into this one single machine. Um, of course, we don't use technologies on every patient. Some patients it's IMRT, some patients it's IGRT, some patients um, are treated with gating and things like that, and some patients get stereotactic. So more than these days at least, IMRT is very prevalent, and so the MLCs or the multi-leaf collimators come into play. Um, and these are constantly moving as the beam is being delivered, um, uh, depending if we do a step and shoot type of an IMRT or even dynamic IMRT, for example. Um, and this is the most common test that is used to make sure that the MLCs are actually positioning themselves where they're supposed to be for a given uh, set of uh, uh, treatments. And so we, we have a QA plan that's loaded in the machine that is supposed to take use to these set positions and we then expose either a film or use the EPID or the onboard imager to come up with these strips it's called a picket fence. And this here is just the central jaw or, or the jaw position uh, for a central 0.5 centimeter strip. And then we come to profiles and then develop these various uh, tests to measure things such as relative leaf position error, the gap width between the leaves, and if there is a hue um, in, the, uh, uh, in the position of C's between one end uh, versus the other. And we can keep track of what's going on on a month-to-month -month basis with all of this. Uh, more recently, uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, volumetric art therapy or VMAT and how it is so much more efficient than MRT in delivering um, those certain patient cases. And so, given that we, uh, you know, we've started to use VMAT a lot more than before, uh, we also have to have tests developed that. Um, to the quality assurance of these types of treatments also. And remember with v mention to the uh, leaves moving while the radiation is being delivered, the gantry is also moving. And so one has or develop tests uh, that kind of measure um, uh, you know, picket fences both with the gantry being static and with the gantry uh, in motion. Uh, and this can happen at several speeds. So we have test plans that kind of generate these picket fence patterns in different gantry speeds, different dose rates, um, and we look at 
parameters such as the skew, um, you know, the accuracy and all that, and we can get information about using an automated program that one can either develop or there are products that are available out there that uh, do such analysis. Uh, in any case, it, it needs to be understood that this also takes some amount of time and it's usually done both on a monthly and an annual basis. Um, usually not done every day. And then there was just this big issue, which is the uh, image guided radiation therapy, or IGRT as they call it. Uh, and the reason for this is that um, modern, again, uh, axles are fitted with these digital radiography systems, also called flat panel detectors, um, which uh, are basically these epids uh, that use flat panel amorphous silicon arrays, um, where the X-rays kind of hit the scintillator arrays and that generates light which is sensed by these analog to digital converters uh, that are attached to these photodiodes and then you get a digital signal uh, from uh, an X-ray interaction that happens. And so <clears throat> these sensors are both available for uh, an MV uh, beam as well as a KV beam. So this is just one example uh, of uh, an OBI system where the uh, imaging OBI, uh, or the KV imaging OBI system is actually perpendicular to the MV imaging uh, OBI system. There are some machines such as the Siemens where this whole KV system is also located inside the treatment head and that's what we call as an inline KV system as opposed to this cross line system that one can see. Um, and then of course uh, these are all um, able to talk to uh, gating system beam control systems um, sometimes. just depends on the model. So with these systems, it is always important to establish the accuracy of the imaging isocenter to the treatment isocenter. Um, on the Varian machine, and I use the Varian as an example here because that's the one that I'm using most of the time uh, here in our practice. Um, so we have a jig like this that's developed by Varian again which has these uh, BBs attached at different points along the cylinder and at specific distances and specific angles as well. This also sits at the end of the couch in a specific uh, location. We align the system to the lasers so that we know where the mechanical ISO center is and then the system runs through these different um, tests both uh, KV X-ray images and MV X-ray images and gives us an idea as to how far away the ISO center is for, for previous months or from a baseline, for example. And so we had quantitative information about that. And that kind of tells how accurate the system can be um, geometrically. Um, these systems are also capable of doing cone beam CT. And so with cone beam CT, in addition to just verifying geometry, we need to also ensure that the Hounsfield units uh, uh, are matched and calibrated and the distances that are measured on the phantom are also calibrated to physical distances. High contrast resolution is also another aspect uh, that one has to be aware of. And then there is this low contrast resolution which is uh, not so great for cone beam CT images uh, but is much better for collimated uh, uh, imaging beams such as the one that you see on, CT, on a regular CT scan. Nevertheless, I'm hoping with whatever screens that you're watching this presentation from, you can at least make a two of these low contrast circles um, on, on this slide. And then we also make some measurements about image uniformity and noise, and this kind of gives us uh, some idea as to how the imager is working on a month-to-month -month basis. Uh, so in summary, modern linear accelerators are actually these very complex machines that serve several functions, such as patient setup, treatment verification, um, including imaging, and treatment delivery. Uh, that includes uh, I, um, IMRT, spread regating, stereotactic delivery, all of those. Um, given all these complex technologies, there is an ever-increasing need for a comprehensive quality assurance program in order to ensure safe and accurate delivery of therapeutic radiation. And with that, an effective QA program can generally improve or greatly improve quality of therapy, thereby directly impacting uh, the patient treatment outcomes. And this happens by improving the precision and accuracy of the dose delivery to the target and also by reducing the potential for and the frequency of
radiation delivery related injuries. And that for today, and I guess uh, I'll be open to any questions. If anyone has any questions, uh, you can write them in the question box on the toolbar. All right, Vidam, if you want to look at the questions, just expand the box and scroll down to the bottom. Uh, yes, handouts will be available. I'll have them posted uh, shortly after the meeting. So some of the questions here are, say... Yeah, just scroll down, scroll down to the very bottom. Okay. Uh, yeah, yes, you will be getting handouts. I'll hand them over to Spencer. Um, about task group guidelines for IGRT, yes, uh, there is a separate task group for IGRT um, as well. It's uh, um, currently in discussion, and they should be making their recommendations very soon. Any other questions? Looks like you're getting off easy. <laughs> All right. So the one is on daily QA, how much of a variation would qualify for physics involvement? And that's a very good question. So uh, the guidelines that we have are that if the variation is 3%, uh, the therapist has to alert the physicist and treatment can still proceed for that day, but the physicist goes back and checks uh, to see if there's anything uh, that needs correction. But if the is more than 3% and less than 5%, uh, the physicist just needs to get alerted uh, right away. And uh, if it's more than 5%, then no treatments can proceed. Uh, hope that question. Uh, and there's another question, do you have to follow all of the TG142 recommendations or are they just guidelines? They are guidelines. Uh, the TG, the task group leaves it to the particular physicist uh, to have their own interpretation of these recommendations. And so they don't really say that you know, this is what you have to follow. It says, how do you QA a VMAX plan with couch rotations? Hmm. Well, that's something we entered so far, and I'm not sure uh, what situation would need a VMAP plan with a, a couch rotation, although I can possibly think of a few. Um, I think a particular physicist has to develop a specific test, uh, like what I showed with the uh, plan without any couch rotations. So as long as we done, we should be okay. Uh, what national so I have a question that says, what national or federal rules are be followed by all vision oncology centers? Um, so there are, depending on the state uh, you live in, there are different guidelines for this. Some of the states actually license physicists as well, uh, in addition to the uh, national uh, uh, or the agencies. And so we have to keep records of uh, 
you know, all these calibrations and outputs that we perform. Uh, and there are a set of, or rather a specific set of these uh, guidelines. Uh, and we have inspectors come from the state and uh, sometimes the federal agencies to just come and audit uh, the calibrations on a periodic basis. I went for the uh, VMAT uh, with the couch kick. If you had a nasal cavity carcinoma with a 90 degree couch kick, yeah, that's probably one of the ones that I was, you know, one of the situations I was thinking of. Um, sort of worked out. Uh, again, uh, in this would involve having the physicist come up with a suitable uh, test uh, plan that incorporates different couch kicks in addition to the VMAT and thereby verifying accuracy of this delivery. Calibration be checked by another physicist. It doesn't hurt uh, uh, to hack by another physicist, certainly, uh, but no, it does not. Do you have dosimeters during any QA? Uh, well, I'm sure every dosimeter has their own set of uh, guidelines to QA uh, treatment planning systems and uh, treatment procedures, but uh, we do not have dosimetrists doing machine QA. Right. Okay, this is another good one. How can you tell the difference between leaf positional error and carriage error on a picket fence test? Uh, we can't. And that's a thing um, that needs to be looked, I guess, uh, you know, in more detail. Uh, so we've, we've started doing these tests only uh, recently. Uh, the MLC QA actually was pretty much, you know, like a stop, a start and stop affair with just doing a picket fence test for a long time. And only recently been a lot more focused on uh, developing more uh, specific tests like what this uh, Attendee has pointed out. Um, so there are that you can do to tell the difference between uh, leaf positional error and carriage error. Uh, one of the things that can be fairly obvious is that if there is a leaf position error, it should not affect all the leaves. It should affect only some of the leaves. Whereas if there is a carriage position error, then you can kind of see it on the film or on the EPID image. Uh, as a total systematic shift of that of all the leaves in that particular carriage, so that would be like a first first order estimate that you know something's wrong with the carriage and not just the leaves. How do the MLC device of an accelerator and what sort of tests would be done? Uh, so as I showed in the uh, presentation, and hopefully you will get the uh, slides uh, or the PDFs uh, uh, of the slides very soon. Uh, we do the QA uh, on a monthly basis and an on, on an annual basis, and there are several different tests that uh, it can be done that include the picket fence test that assists for things such as uh, skewness between the various leaves, just the dosimetric leaf gap, and several other parameters um, that uh, you can get some idea by just looking at the slides. Uh, the question says, do you find that it is needed to do two different collimator rotations for a two arc plan? That's 45 and a 315 degree for leakage. Uh, <coughs> yeah, typically that actually helps, not just for leakage, but also to offset systematic errors uh, that occur during uh, the delivery as well. Can a mechanical QA? Uh, well, anybody can do the mechanical QA. Uh, the question is, uh, well, what are the agency that's overseeing your operations be acceptable to that, I guess. Uh, but the real anyone that can be trained to do these over a period of time, do mechanical QAs and even the other sorts of uh, quality assurance, as long as it's being overseen by somebody that's qualified, I guess.
our QA procedures be automated someday? Uh, most of these are actually automated. Uh, but yeah, the holy grail of uh, QA and actually some of the companies that develop these uh, various devices is to have one single device that can kind of automatically wheel itself into the room, uh, do all the measurements and then just uh, wheel itself out and uh, spit out this uh, report that says, hey, everything's good. Uh, but I'm not there. Uh, All right, beam flatness change year to year, and how do you fix this? Uh, well, the beam flatness changes again, uh, because remember, these are all uh, the electromechanical devices, and things do uh, burn out, uh, so to say, uh, or wear out due to repeated use. And so, you know, the currents in the uh, magnets that actually control uh, the electron beams or steer the electron beams can um, and depending upon where this beam ends up hitting the flattening filter, uh, that position could also change the beam flatness. And so it does not change just on a year-to-year -year basis. It actually changes per, you know, on a per delivery basis, except those changes are really small uh, that you can't uh, measure them. Uh, but, you know, over a year, yeah, you, can, you can definitely expect it to change. And the way to fix this is it just depends on the type of machine. Um, uh, sometimes we can steer beams uh, by adjusting the magnetic fields that control the electron beams that hit the target and that will uh, help with the flatness. Sometimes it's just a question of you know trying to move the flattening filter and uh, make sure it's you know right geometrically in the center of the beam path but that's not something that's uh, recommended. You have to try steering all the other um, or using all the other options to steer the beam rather than actually have to physically move the flapping filter. Are inserts that can do diagnostic or uh, QA? Uh, I'm not, uh, exactly what uh, the uh, question is in, but let me try to answer that. Uh, Yes, there are some sense that the QA program itself kind of, uh, you know, if it's done properly and implemented properly, will point out or help predict future things that can happen to the machine. Um, and again, this is an area where some of the physicists are working to develop uh, automated algorithms, algorithms that will uh, come up with, uh, you know, some predictive numbers to say, okay, such components are going to fail in the next uh, you know, few months, few years, few days, so just do what's called preventive maintenance before it actually happens and that will save you some time. Uh, but as of now, uh, there are not too many of them uh, that do this. basis, except those changes are really small uh, that you can't uh, measure them, uh, but you know, over a year, yeah, you, can, you can definitely expect it to change. And the way to fix this is it just depends on the type of machine. Um, uh, sometimes we can steer beams uh, by adjusting the magnetic fields that control the electron beams that hit the target, and that will uh, help with the flatness. Sometimes it's just a question of you know, trying to move the flattening filter and uh, make sure it's, you know, right geometrically in the center of the beam path, but that's not something that's uh, recommended. You have to try steering all the other, um, or using all the other options to steer the beam rather than actually have to physically move the flattening filter. Are inserts that can do diagnostic or uh, QA? Um, 
I'm not uh, exactly what uh, the uh, question is in, but let me try to answer that. Uh, yes, there are some sense that the QA program itself kind of, uh, you know, if it's done properly and implemented properly, will point out or help predict future things that can happen to the machine. Um, and again, this is an area where some of the physicists are working to develop uh, automated algorithms, algorithms that will uh, come up with, uh, you know, some predictive numbers to say, okay, such components are going to fail in the next, uh, you know, few months, few years, few days. So just do what's called preventive maintenance before it actually happens, and that'll save you some time. Uh, but as of now, uh, there are not too many of them uh, that do this.